thank you very much. There's no chance that after lunch I'll fall asleep listening to his conversation, but now to listen to Attila's story, instead of being sleepy, I'm depressed. In fact, because, uh, uh, but, but also depressed by the general situation, but inspired by his personal story. I want to, to get back to that in, in a moment. Uh, but, but first of all, I'm very, uh, very pleased to be here today to, to speak because as I'm not only a journalist, but also a teacher for the past uh, several years in Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and now also in, in Hong Kong to mainland Chinese. And one thing I often tell people is that the best way to, one of the best ways to get a sense for how tolerant or how liberal a society is, is by looking at uh, how they treat their media and their minorities. And here we are with two panel discussions this afternoon looking at both, which are both, uh, of course, very revealing about the Hungarian situation, the health of Hungarian democracy. But since, since the, uh, this panel discussion is about uh, challenges in the 21st century, we've heard about the, the Hungarian media law and some concrete example from, from Attila, I want to, to speak a little bit about the, the regional context as well, but looking at, at the future a bit. And by the future, I mean young, aspiring journalists, uh, even student journalists, what kind of journalism education they're receiving. Um, like I said, I've, uh, I taught for two years in provincial Slovakia at the University of uh, St. Cyril and Metodius in Ternava, and also in Brno uh, at Masaryk University, the second largest university in the Czech Republic. And <clears throat> Uh, just, just a couple weeks ago, I happened to, I had one student in Ternavo, one Slovak student, who was one of the rare examples of a student who, every time I looked around the room during a lecture, her eyes were right on me. I'm assuming it's because she was interested in, in journalism and nothing else. I never had to, 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 to scold her. I never had to say, hey, stop Facebooking your friends, stop serving the internet. She was into journalism, and I had high hopes for her journalism career in Slovakia. And just a couple weeks ago, I was able to, to track her down for an article I'm actually writing about journalism education in Central Europe. And uh, uh, Katarina today is working for a national news network in Slovakia, not in the capital of Bratislava, but in Kosice, <coughs> in Kasha, uh, Slovakia's second largest city. And she sent me a link to what she had produced, a recent story she'd written, uh, produced on, on the air, on TV. And uh, it was her out in the streets uh, interviewing some environmental activists who were protesting against a city plan to destroy these uh, beautiful old trees in one of the rare green spaces downtown to build some new project. And the environmental activists were at the protesting and Katarina is there telling their story. Okay, this is simple day-to-day -day news reporting, something's happening, we need to send a reporter out there to, to cover it. And I said, Katarina, that was, a, that was a good job, you know, what might be interesting for is to perhaps follow up. This could be a very interesting window onto, let's say, the state of environmental activism. 20 years later, I'm always looking for these windows. Window onto the, the transition, the post-communist transition. 20 years later, this is an example of what sort of environmental activism is going on in Slovakia, perhaps even across the region. Or, or so here's another idea. How about using this as a window onto civil society 20 years into the, the transition? As to what civil society, what activists are doing to try to uh, put pressure on local governments and national governments to, 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 uh, to create change. She's like, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for the Musa, I just learned the Slovak word. Musa is inspiracia, okay, inspiration. But you must to understand my situation, she said. Okay. Now, first of all, our TV station no longer does publicistica, publicistica, which, and I said, what exactly is that? How do you define it? She said, we don't do news features, we don't do analysis pieces anymore. So well, why not? Because this, th these are the kinds of stories when you think about that would really say something about Slovak society today. How far have we come as a society? So we don't do that sort of thing anymore. First of all, no money to do that, no resources. I'm expected to produce a, a story every day. My editor says, where is your story? I don't care what it's about, just give me a story every day. Second of all, people that, that in Slovakia today, if you are misquoted, if, even if you're not misquoted, Someone can attack you, attack your employer, and say, hey, you twist my words around, I'm going to sue you, right? Hooray for democracy. Now we can sue you for, for using my words in a way that I, as a source, don't appreciate. So we don't even touch these stories anymore. So I was a little depressed by that. And, but there's more to, to, to Katharina's story. She said, you know, I'm a young reporter. I know I'm making a lot of mistakes. But also, my editor in Bratislava, she's young herself. She's only been doing this for a few years. She has dozens of staffers across the country and in Bratislava. 
She has no time to give me any feedback, any guidance on how to improve my work. Um, she said that, for example, one, one, uh, uh, one morning she got notes from the morning meeting that said, Katharina did not do a good job with the story. She said, well, what exactly did I do wrong? How can I improve? There was no further advice, no further word, because, of course, the editor has no time to send out emails or have phone calls or uh, phone conversations or in-person conversations to guide, to coach, to train these young journalists how to do their work better. So when we're talking about the situation today, why is this important to look at young journalists, the situation that they're facing, and, and I'll talk in a minute about the kind of education that Katharina received in university. This is the future. This, as, as you know from listening to the Hungarian example, uh, I can talk about the Slovak example, um, Neiman reports, Harvard's Neiman reports, which focuses on journalism around the world. They just had a recent issue all on post-communist Eastern Europe about the challenges of reporting corruption, investigative reporting all across Eastern Europe. The political pressures, economic pressures, legal pressures, not to mention threats of violence, okay, which typically don't happen in Central Europe, but farther to the east. So a watchdog journalism, a, a form of watchdog journalism is needed today more than ever. Okay, If this example of the media law had happened before 2004, uh, before Hungary joined the EU, I can imagine that Brussels would have put the squeeze and said, hey, cut it out. Enough of that nonsense. You want to join our club? We're not going to tolerate this kind of law. And they probably would have snuffed it out. They probably would have killed it then. But now there's less and less pressure coming from Brussels. The only real external pressure, it seems, is when the international press, the international media picks up on a story and makes a big deal out of uh, uh, media law, that sort of thing. So, so the role today of the uh, uh, journalists is, has never been more important for, for Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, just to let you know that I've been in the region now uh, for most of the past 18 years. I lived in Hungary from 93 to 2000. Now I live in Slovakia for, for the past five years as a foreign correspondent, also teaching journalism. And, and looking at the situation in, in Slovakia and the Czech Republic, a bit more about the education there. One of Katarina's big problems as well, the reason why she needs this coaching and training is because back when she was studying journalism at university, she had extremely little practical, hands-on experience. Okay, she's still being taught by old school professors, some of them she said, 50s, 60s, 70s, no offense to anyone in their 50s, 60s, 70s, but these are folks who had not worked in journalism for decades, and even when they did, what kind of journalism were they practicing? Was it more propaganda than journalism? That's a big problem. And understand, to be fair to their professors, they're also poorly paid. And if you have 50, 80, 100 students in class, you can't send them all out to do reporting in the streets. Imagine that kind of uh, work to, to edit these papers for so little salary. So they're giving you know, pluses, minuses for for theoretical papers, counting the number of pages they've written, and that's it. So then they go off into their newspaper job or TV job, really not knowing how to, to produce journalism. Okay? On the other hand, one thing that was very interesting for talking about a, a, a challenge for today and the future was how striking it was that here I was teaching 20-year-old Slovak students and 20-year-old Czech students. And here I thought to myself, as, uh, as an American, but still someone who's lived in the region for many years, my wife is Hungarian. I have a vested interest in this region, too. I'm not just an outsider. I have uh, three children who are also dual Hungarian US citizens, so I care about the kind of Hungary they're going to be uh, living, living in and visiting over the years. Um, but I w teaching these 20-something-year-olds, these I was very struck by this idea that here I thought, well, if they were born in 89, 90, you would think that they were maybe blank slates. Maybe they weren't affected by the ancien regime, okay? They weren't affected by the old days, by censorship and self-censorship. I thought maybe they'd be a blank slate. In fact, they're not. They are heavily, of course, influenced by their parents and their grandparents, what their grandparents taught their parents, what their parents taught them about keeping your head down, not making noise, not making waves, not causing problems for yourself. So the most difficult problem I had in teaching them as young journalists, even two, three years ago, this is a Slovakian Czech Republic solidly entrenched in the European Union, is to ask a simple question, why? The most essential question in journalism, not just to describe, there are protesters on the streets protesting against these trees. Okay, that's what the situation is. Any, no offense, chimpanzee can learn to describe what the situation is. A real journalist must explore why exactly are they out here, what exactly are they trying to accomplish, will it succeed or not, to really dig beneath the surface to ask tough questions. And these young Slovaks and Czechs, and I'm assuming that this situation is similar in Hungary, Poland, elsewhere, 
it was very difficult for them to ask this question, this, this, to challenge authority, why, why, why. This isn't just about investigative reporting. This is straightforward, essential, watchdog journalism. Okay? So this is my concern um, about uh, today and into, into the future. But also, Attila described the situation and, and his stand, his personal stand. Um, but one thing I'd like to hear more about is that what can be done? What can be done uh, uh, now and into the future? Uh, Ishvan mentioned <clears throat> this, this campaign, 85,000 signatories or, or, or Facebook friends uh, of this pro-democracy campaign. I, I do see that uh, 22 years now into this whole transition, a renewed uh, crusade is needed, a campaign is needed, a pro-democracy campaign. Obviously, it's going to be very difficult. People are very uh, apathetic. People are exhausted, I can imagine, especially those who were there from the beginning. But how to nurture and cultivate that young generation? Stories like Attila's need to be uh, exploited. They need to be taken advantage, advantage of for, for history to be explained. Not just what he did, but why exactly he, he did that to, to help inform and educate even the Hungarian public that they recognize why there were these demonstrations, why there were these protests, what does democracy and freedom mean to them. No, two minutes? Five. <laughs> I feel like oh, oh. Yeah, uh, certainly, uh, certainly the, these campaigns to, to, to let people know, uh, to think about the kind of democracy they're living in and want to live in in the future, but also, also, uh, when I entered journalism, and I don't think any uh, young person would enter journalism anywhere in the world with the idea of getting rich. Not everyone can be, let's say, Christian Amanpour or what have you. Okay? Only a fool would go into journalism to become rich. You have to go into journalism for something else. And when I was young, uh, my professor used to talk about a calling, that you need to have a calling. Okay, because you're going to be poorly paid, you're going to bang your head against the wall so many times and deal with all kinds of, pardon my French, bullshit about the job. But there has to be something over, overarching, overriding that which is a sense of mission, a sense of purpose. And one way to, I, I see that, that, that this is going to be very difficult. If, if, if young people hear Attila's story, they see the media law in Hungary today, how are you going to attract young Hungarians into journalism, this essential pillar of, of democracy? How are you going to attract young people into this field? And I do see the need, speaking of solutions, I, I see the need for uh, mentoring mentoring program. This was mentioned by one of the contributors, a Polish contributor, saying that we don't have mentoring in, in Poland. I mean, imagine someone like Attila. I can only imagine how busy he must be during the course of his day. If he had one, two, five young journalists working under him, you might think, I don't have time to take one, two, three hours out of my week to sit down with them, to look at the work they produce, and to say, here's how you can do it better. Let me take you under my wing, kid, and show you how it should be done, okay? Obviously, there's not enough older generation journalists to help out, it's a, it's a younger journalist profession. There is a need, I'm trying to lobby the U.S. Embassy <clears throat> in, uh, in Bratislava to get involved with this, uh, to do something with mentoring, to give perhaps one, two hundred euros extra a month to people like Attila, not to keep saying when you have, but somehow <laughs> there has to be a, some sort of financial incentive, please, you know, for the, for the good of the nation. Right? That we need people like you to sit down with young people and inspire and motivate. So that even if they're not going to be paid well, at least they can say, one day I want to be like Mon Attila. Okay? That sort of thing. Right? To encourage and nurture this, this calling, uh, this, this sense of mission. I guess I can finish there. Uh, but, yeah, I, I can only imagine how much work needs to be done to, to rebuild this, this campaign.